Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jeremy Leffler, and I work in the policy office at the National Science Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to another session of the NSF Virtual Grants Conference. And I am uh, pleased now uh, to present uh, this session, which will cover the work of the NSF Office of the Inspector General. And this session will be presented by Laurel Hester, Laura Slatten, and Kelly Stefanko. Hello, this is Laura Slatten. I'm a criminal investigator with the National Science Foundation. Welcome to NSS Office of Inspector General NSF Grants Conference, November 2022. Uh, I am fairly new to NSF. I started here about a year ago in the uh, criminal investigative division, the pro uh, program integrity. And but I was with the Department of Energy for almost 20 years with their Office of Inspector General. Uh, and so uh, we've got three presenters, including myself today, that we're going to talk about some information that hopefully will benefit you in working with the grants you have with us. Kelly? I'm Kelly Stefanko. I'm an audit manager. I've worked in the Office of Inspector General at two other federal agencies, so NSF is my third OIG, and I've been here for about 12 years. Hello, I'm Laurel and I joined the Office of Inspector General a year and a half ago after many years in academia as a biology professor and then assistant provost in a small college. And uh, during most of my time in academia, I was not familiar with what an Office of Inspector General was or what they do. In case any of you are in a similar situation, we thought we'd note that an Office of Inspector General is an independent office that promotes economy, efficiency, and effectiveness, prevents and detects fraud, waste, and abuse in agency programs and operations, has full access to records and subpoena power, and reports to the head of the government agency, in the case of NSF, that's the National Science Board, uh, and also to Congress. This presentation describes what our office does and how we interact with NSF supported institutions during audits and investigations. We conclude with some case study examples. To learn more, please visit our webpage, which should pop up on any web search for NSF OIG. Now, back to Kelly, who will tell you more about what NSF's Office of Inspector General does. So what do we do in the Office of Inspector General? We have two main sides of our house, an Office of Investigations, where Laura and Laurel work, and they'll be discussing a little later, and an Office of Audits, which is where I work. Additionally, as part of our mission to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse, we conduct outreach presentations to the research community at institutions, conferences, and other meetings. Just like today, OIG investigators, auditors, and attorneys provide education about recognizing and preventing fraud, administrating federal funds, and promoting responsible conduct of research. So in the Office of Audits, we conduct audits of NSF's programs to identify ways to improve systems and operations. We call those internal audits. We also do a lot of audits where the awardee institution is the focus. We call those external audits. And sometimes to really understand the challenges awardees are facing in a given program, we have to conduct audit work on specific awards at the awardee institution. And we've been calling those hybrid audits. And we've recently done this type of audit for the established program to stimulate competitive research, EPSCOR, and the Graduate Research Fellowship Program, GRFP. So I'm going to focus my discussion today on our external audits of specific awardees and single audit and quality control assurance reviews, as those are the functions that are probably of most interest to you all as an audience of NSF award recipients. Okay, so as we approach each fiscal year, we come up with an audit plan, what we plan to audit. There are, of course, a number of audits that we're required to do by law, like the annual financial audit of the NSF that's required by the Chief Financial Officers Act or the CFO Act, and a review of IT system controls that's required by the Federal Information Security Modernization Act or FISMA. The more discretionary part of our plan is based on consideration of a number of factors, 
First, the ones you see in green. You consider congressional requests and single audit results. And you see some in blue. We, were, we get requests from the National Science Board and NSF. And we consider areas we've identified as NSF's most serious management and performance challenges, which are listed in a report that the OIG annually puts together. It's available on our website. We also consider any referrals from our Office of Investigations and we perform our own risk-based assessment, which I'll talk about more later. Um, all of this ultimately leads to a developed, finalized, and approved audit plan. So let's talk about typical audits and reviews that you may be called upon to participate in. External audits. So in a given year, we can typically complete 20 to 24 external audits. In October, we just, added in, we just sent out engagement memos for about 10 new audits. So if you didn't get one of those, you can breathe a sign of relief for now at least. Um, most are done by independent public accounting firms that are under contract to us. The external auditors are not just a review of incurred costs on a single award. Instead, the auditors look at costs claimed on all NSF awards during the audit scope. The auditors use data analytics on the general ledger to identify risk areas across the institution. So a typical external audit will review financial systems and expenditures and compare drawdowns to the accounting system. As I mentioned earlier, we've also been doing a few audits of awardees each year as part of program specific audits. I had mentioned the EPS score and the GRFP. And these audits often focus on specific um, areas specific to helping us understand where awardees might need more guidance in a unique aspect of a given program. So the other um, area is single audit reviews. And as you all know, award recipients that spend 750,000 or more federal funds in a year have to obtain a single audit, which is an important oversight tool. We review the quality of single audits of award recipients for which NSF has audit cognizance, which is generally those institutions that receive the majority of their federal funding from NSF. We also review other award recipients when we have concerns about the NSF related information contained in their single audit reports. So we also do quality control reviews of the auditor's work to determine if the single audits comply with the federal requirements and the professional auditing standards. These may include a review of source documentation um, that the award institution provided during um, the prior audit testing. So our quality assurance work helps us to ensure that single audits can be relied on by government agencies and pass-through entities as part of their awardee monitoring work. Okay, so every year as we're putting our annual plan together, we update and run our external audit risk model. Think of this, NSF manages more than 56,000 active awards. We're an audit office of about 33 people. So we can't audit everything, uh, which is why we've developed this risk model to help us focus our resources and select institutions to audit. So the first thing we have to do is gather the universe of NSF awards. Then we define the population of awardees, because as I mentioned, we typically select an auditee, not a specific award. Then uh, we test cost claimed on all of the NSF awards for that awardee for a given audit scope period. This model takes in a number of factors, internal ones like drawdown pattern, uh, the number and value of NSF awards, as well as external ones, such as single audit findings. So we put all of this information together to help us in selecting institutions to audit. Okay, so how does our single audit review selection process work? So for Audit E 2020 year end, which is the most recent complete database, there were more than 39,000 single audits which included nearly 6.2 billion in NSF expenditures. So of those, 75 fell under NSF cognizance or oversight responsibilities and received a desk review. Uh, the NSF OIG, we aim to select two to three single audits per year for a quality control review. We consider auditing firm characteristics such as 
the volume and risk exposure of NSF funds and the percentage of low risk or no finding oddities in determining which to select. The Governmental Audit Quality Center, GAQC, it promotes the importance of quality governmental audits and the value of such audits to purchasers of governmental audit services. GAQC is a voluntary membership center for CPA firms and state audit um, organizations that perform governmental audits. So being a member of GAQC lowers the risk score for auditors because it's an indicator that the firm is taking additional steps to improve the quality of their work. And we have found through our work that the member firms tend to have fewer audit quality deficiencies. You have to pay to be a member. So it's um, also a sign that the firm is invested in this kind of work. Uh, if you happen to get the Encura magazine, you may have seen this OIG uh, written article where we explain this process. So, um, an external audit takes about a year from the engagement memo, which is shown in step one here, to the final report, uh, which is shown here as step six. The OIG will initiate the audit with the engagement letter and an entrance conference with the auditee. Uh, we summarize any findings and potential recommendations into a discussion draft or we may use a notice of preliminary findings and recommendations, we call those NPFRs, to communicate issues during the fieldwork phase. So either way, there should be no surprises by the time you receive a formal draft, especially since we meet to discuss these at an exit conference. Then we issue a draft report and auditees have 30 days to respond to it. Uh, that response is incorporated into the final report in its entirety. If your single auditor is part of our quality assurance review, that's gonna be a much faster process. It usually involves about two weeks of on-site work and our goal is a three month review process from start to finish. Um, the resulting letters and reports are provided to the, uh, the awardee, the auditors, federal funding agencies, and where applicable uh, pass-through entities. Um, again, your participation as a grant recipient would be very limited probably just to steps one and step six, um, as a recipient will receive a copy of the engagement letter in the final report. Um, award, awardee recipients may be contacted during field work, uh, which is that stuff performed between steps two and three, but they generally are not involved in the discussion of the field work or the formal draft report. Okay, so, um, a couple of recent uh, reports I wanted to bring your attention to. Um, both of these are publicly available on our uh, NSF OIG website. Um, the first was called Promising Practices for NSF Award Management. And it's a capstone report based on opportunities for improvements seen through 18 uh, completed audits that we did. And this report is intended to help members of the recipient community strengthen award management practices and improve the overall stewardship of federal funds across the NSF award recipient population. And you can see here are five resulting suggestions for implementing a strong award management environment. The second audit, um, if you happen to have EPSCORE words, you may wanna check out um, this capstone report. It was our capstone report on um, EPSCORE, and it was a result of nearly three years worth of extensive audit work we did on the EPSCORE program, both at NSF and at several awardees. And you can see here the three key issues we identified at these multiple EPSCORE recipients. And our report includes associated suggestions intended to help the EPSCORE recipient community address them. So I want to say thank you for your attention. I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues to tell you more about OIG investigations. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so we're going to talk about investigations, which I believe Laurel mentioned earlier. There's a research integrity and a program integrity. Um, we've got a lot of information to cover. And as you can tell by my accent, I'm from New York. And so being a Southerner, it's hard for me to talk fast. So I will do my best. And, and again, feel free to put questions in the chat as we go along. And we'll have a little bit of time at the end of this, hopefully for you guys to ask some questions as well. 
So the big thing that we do is detect and prevent fraud. Um, and in doing that, when we're talking fraud, we're talking investigative criminal, civil, and administrative matters. Now, the big difference between criminal and civil investigation is the burden of proof. And the thing I like to do for a lot of people for that is bring up uh, the O.J. Simpson case as a good example of that. The, uh, the police were not able to put on enough evidence to have the jury convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the threshold you have to do. It's much higher in a criminal investigation beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and so he was acquitted. However, the family sued civilly and he was prosecuted for civil because in a civil investigation, if you're thinking of the scales of justice, you only have to tip that scale 51%. And so that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're talking about investigations. Uh, administrative matters is another way that we can have a, a way of remedying some uh, waste, fraud, or abuse within the agency. Um, and what we do with that is we'll write a report regarding our investigation to NSF directly, recommending that they take some sort of action. And similar to a civil matter, the administration uh, investigations are based upon the preponderance of evidence as well. Um, Everything that we investigate is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, involving alleged wrongdoing with basically any NSF money. So that would include proposals, awards, those who conduct business with us, contractors, grantees, subcontractors. And so it's NSF money all the way down. So if you have a grant and they subcontract out part of the work and they subcontract part of the work, it's all the way down. So even if they're doing uh, money laundering with this. They're generating fake invoices from a dummy company or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's it's NSF money, even though it was used for uh, fraud purposes. So we're going to talk about some types of the allegations. Um, in a moment, I'm going to pass it to Laurel to talk about the plagiarism and falsification box here at the top. But um, one of the things that I wanted to discuss here is that uh, most of the cases that we work are white collar crimes, such as the ones here listed on the slide. And the United States Code is our Bible, if you will, when it comes to uh, criminal or civil investigations that outlines each crime and what the elements are needed in order to prove that crime. That's the elements that the jury will consider when they go to trial. Um, and the reason why we wanted to talk to you about this today and thank you for being here is that you are our eyes and ears in the field. Um, we can do some data analytics and some proactive work, um, but the most resourceful cases, the best uh, breaks, if you will, that we've had with a lot of uh, our investigations come from people who are in the trenches and looking at this stuff every day. And one thing I always like to tell everybody is if it doesn't look right, smell right, feel right, probably not. And so raise your hand and talk to somebody, whether that's your supervisor, uh, we'll mention an OIG hotline later that you can report anonymously or whatever, um, but you are the ones who uh, would notice any red flags and hopefully bring those forward to us. Um, some of the things, we'll touch on some of these later, but uh, just for this particular slide regarding conflicts of interest issues, um, those are protect the integrities of the grants panel reviews, as well as ensure that the process is fair and unbiased so that we don't have you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your kind of situation going here where somebody's on a review panel and one of their buddies is getting picked over someone who might be more qualified. Duplicative funding, um, we get those more often than you think, is where they get a grant from us to do the exact same thing that they got a grant maybe from NIH or DOE or another agency to do. Uh, so they're double dipping. And uh, abuse of government funds, we also get a lot where people are not spending the money like they should, like they said they were going to. They're using it on personal items, uh, trips, cars, credit cards. I even had a case where a guy was uh, using the money to buy cocaine. So you just, you never know where these cases will take us. And we'll talk about some case studies later to, to maybe bring this home a little bit better. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna pass it over to Laurel to go over the plagiarism part of this. Yeah, thank you, Laura. So, uh, for our administrative cases, um, most of them involve some sort of research misconduct, data fabrication, falsification, or uh, plagiarism. And um, so, and pl of those, plagiarism 
is actually the most common type of research misconduct allegation that we deal with. And uh, any type of research misconduct in grant proposals or in performing awarded grants is a type of grant fraud. And by regulation, our office handles those allegations that is, as an administrative matter. In general, for civil, criminal, or administrative matters, we receive allegations from a number of sources, grant PIs, program officers, review panelists, university administrators, faculty members, anyone can confidentially contact NSF OIG, uh, and really anyone from ex-spouses to uh, someone scanning peer pub comments. So if you or anyone you know has an allegation you should consider, uh, please uh, consider submitting it via the orange report fraud, waste, or abuse button at the top of our webpage. Uh, we'll show you what that looks like later. Uh, we'll also provide contact numbers at the end of this presentation. Uh, also, I know many of you are uh, university administrators, and so you may know that universities are also required to inform our office if they decide an investigation is warranted in a research misconduct matter. So administrators uh, often contact our office in their official capacities as well as um, sometimes as individuals. So um, now that you have an idea of some of the ways in which we receive allegations, uh, I want to talk just a little bit about our investigative process. When we receive an allegation, we first review it to determine if there is an NSF link. If there is, our primary job is to fact find. And we do that by reviewing records, interviewing knowledgeable people, issuing subpoenas, and um, possibly even issuing search warrants in criminal matters. We may also refer the matter to our Office of Audits or to another agency if their funds are involved. In the case of research misconduct, by regulation, we normally refer investigations uh, that come in on our side to the university involved. Uh, whereas for civil and criminal matters, uh, we refer to a U.S. Attorney's Office. In many of our administrative investigations, uh, we draft a report and refer the matter to NSF for adjudication. When appropriate, administrative cases are written up in a report, uh, and that report goes to NSF's Chief Operating Officer um, for that adjudication. Uh, on the other hand, our office's special agents like Laura uh, and uh, investigative attorneys would work with the Department of Justice or state prosecutors in civil or criminal cases. For all of these, our goal is to protect the interests of the federal government and the U.S. taxpayer. So I'm going to talk just a little bit more about our administrative cases before handing it back over to Laura for some case uh, studies. As alluded to earlier, the main type of administrative matter that we handle is research misconduct. These investigations are governed by the NSF regulation shown here, which, guided by the Office of Science and Technology Policy, defines research misconduct as falsification and fabrication of data and plagiarism. Other types of administrative cases we investigate are conflict of interest, violations of confidentiality in NSF's merit review process, and violations by NSF-funded researchers or institutions of rules regarding research on human subjects. The Office of Investigation also investigates grantee whistleblower retaliation claims, uh, which I'll discuss a bit more later in the presentation. Uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Laura. Uh, to tell you a bit more about our civil and criminal cases. Thanks, Laurel. So this is uh, some frequently used statutes. Remember earlier I told you about the Bible that we use U.S. code. So here are some uh, examples of the most frequent types of violations that we work within the program integrity. Um, I'm not going to bore you with U.S. code, you know, Section 18 title, whatever. Uh, but I do want to go through some of these quickly just to let you know some of the stuff that we do work on in the cases that we do. So the thing I want you to remember the most about this uh, 
part of the presentation is that for white collar cases, such as the ones we primarily work here, the devil is in the details. And so what all of our investigations come down to is what did the person say they would do and didn't do, or maybe what they were supposed to do and um, didn't do. And so um, some of these things we're going to go over, uh, we'll talk more in depth on some case studies, but we'll start with the first bubble, which talks about conspiracy. And that's where two or more people collude together to commit a crime. And so a lot of times when we were mentioning the um, conflicts of interest, you've got two people who say, hey, I'll give you this grant. You give me you know, the subcontract. Once you get the grant, you'll subcontract of it, part of it back to me. And so although that is a conflict of interest, it's also a conspiracy. Uh, criminal false claims is the green bubble there. And I like to call this one the Martha Stewart Clause. Because one way that they'll help you remember is that when they were investigating Martha Stewart for insider trading, they couldn't prove that she did insider trading, but they could prove that she lied to federal agents. And so that's something to remember, uh, a big distinction between working with federal agents versus your local law enforcement. That's there is a statute here, um, said I wouldn't do this, but 18 U.S. Code 1001 that says that uh, lying to federal agents is a crime. And so uh, that's what she actually ended up going to jail for. Uh, another bubble up here is the civil false claims where you're certifying something's true when it wasn't or took place and it didn't. So when you're talking about civil cases, again, we're going back to the O.J. Simpson case when the civil prosecution that he got, that is about money and recovering damages. And so for instances of NSF, there's a lot of places in the award process where the uh, awardee is certifying to certain information. They're certifying they don't have any conflicts of interest. They're certifying that uh, when they do their drawdowns for the award money, they're certifying that everything was true and accurate. And that's just to name a few. And so every one of those certifications, if anything in those is false, then that's a false claim. And uh, that can be prosecuted both civilly and criminally. And so again, civil cases are all about money damages. Uh, the next little bubble that's always really interesting, you may have seen on the news a lot where somebody pleads guilty to mail fraud or wire fraud. 99% um, of the time when that happens, just FYI, is there's actually more on the table as far as to what this person or company actually did. Uh, it's not just wire fraud, but they pled down to a lesser charge in cooperating with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And so um, more than likely, there was something more serious, money laundering, bid rigging, kickbacks, those kind of things. But uh, like you see on Law and Order, where they'll plead down to lesser charges, uh, the same thing happens here in white collar as well. And uh, wire fraud and mail fraud is basically where uh, you use the internet or the U.S. Postal Service to uh, further the crime, whether that's shoot an email, put something in regular mail that supports the falsity that's being committed. So investigative outcomes. We talked a little bit about those earlier. Um, one thing I want you guys to, to recognize here is everybody thinks it's cool to be a federal agent and everybody watches all these shows on TV. But the thing that uh, is very humbling uh, for anybody that an agent needs to remember is uh, we don't do anything but collect information and evidence. We are not the ones who make the decision whether or not to prosecute somebody. That's DOJ. And so we just do our best to collect the evidence that's available, whether that's through interviews, search warrants, whatever, uh, working with you all to help us confirm or, or uh, refute anything that may be accurate or inaccurate in some of these grants and awards. So you'll see us come to you quite a bit to help us understand because we're not the scientists. Um, and if you don't have a victim, you don't have a crime. So there needs to be somebody to tell us, yes, you know, we were wronged or they didn't do what they were supposed to. And so it takes a village to work these kind of cases. Uh, many of our cases are worked jointly with NIH, uh, DOE, even the IRS or the FBI, um, just because if they're getting grants from us, they're more than likely getting grants for research with other agencies as well. Um, and so DOJ is one remedy that we can do this through prosecution. Uh, again, they do plea deals, they can do fines, there's actually imprisonment. Um, we'll talk about some cases on how some of those work later. 
And also, like I said, we can refer matters to NSF uh, through certain reports. And administrative remedy uh, is suspension and debarment. You may or may not be aware of that. And we can suspend an award pending the results of the investigation. And if it turns out that the person did actually commit this act, then they can be debarred. And that's usually for three to five years, meaning that they can't get any government money. And it's not just NSF money. When you're debarred, you can't get any government money, whether it's a VA loan or, or anything like that at all, student loans. So uh, it's not meant to be a punishment. It's meant to protect the government's interest. And then um, we also, just like audits can refer things to us, uh, we can come across some things when we're doing our investigations, like they don't have proper internal controls to prevent the crime that we see being committed. And so we will work in tandem with that on sometimes some other things as well. So here's the fun part. Everybody remembers the stories. Case study one, falsified documents during the audit leads to Civil False Claims Act. This is a great example where we would work with Kelly's department, uh, where they went in and you can see what went wrong. The audits was conducted and they were inadequate controls to prevent the employees from fabricating timesheets. And so when the auditors, like Kelly said, there's an engagement letter. Uh, where they say, hey, we're going to come audit you. And uh, so everybody, anybody that's been audited, you know, the first thing you do is you start getting all your ducks in a row. You start gathering all your papers and make sure you got everything squared away and can give it to the auditor and get them out of your hair as quick as possible. No offense, Kelly. I used to be an auditor too, so I can say that. Um, and so in preparation for the audit, the auditee received the engagement letter. And so they started looking at everything and they noticed that they had some documents that were missing. Um, and so what they did is they directed the PIs to submit backdated reports based on salary amounts that hadn't that had been paid. And so there was an, actually an email where uh, it says, please gather and create these specific items for them being the auditors. I need 13 timesheets and make sure they are signed and dated for the current month that they are requesting. So that's a good little piece of evidence that we came across where they're fabricating data to meet what they reported to NSF. Um, the uh, research compliance coordinator emailed uh, those who with missing reports and directed them to complete the forms and comply with the amounts charged to the awards. Uh, sometimes when we started looking at the documents, and I'll caveat, I didn't work this case because again, I'm fairly new, but um, I've seen this before in some of the other investigations in my past is where people backdate information, they force signatures and they may change numbers like uh, a nine to an eight or a three to an eight. So that was some things that we had seen. So if you come across some of those things, when you're looking at documents that people are submitting to you for your review and putting things together, uh, that's definitely a big red flag. Um, so with this case, uh, the uh, outcome ended up being 1.17 million settlement and uh, they had to come up with a five-year compliance plan. Uh, and there was a civil case regarding this where the compliance coordinator pled guilty and was sentenced to one year probation. So again, that's a good example of us working with audits. Next slide. So this investigation is unallocable grad student teaching costs were improperly charged to the research grants. And so for this particular case, they had a uh, research student who was doing some teaching and uh, they were charging his time for doing so to the grant rather than when this student was uh, doing some research. They may have been charging both, I'm not sure. Um, so we went in and we looked at that and um, determined that they were paying, it was just a policy, the university didn't have good internal controls to separate the money. And so uh, basically what we ended up doing was uh, the case was brought to the U.S. Attorney's Office and accepted for civil prosecution, again, because we're talking about money, and a settlement was reached here for $3.75 million. So um, I'm not sure how far back this went, but that's something to keep in mind, too, is that these teaching and research it needs to be kept separate. You know, again, it comes down to the terms and conditions of the grant, the devil's in the detail. What are you supposed to do with the money that NSF is giving you? So next slide. A uh, former professor convicted of grant fraud. This is a fairly recent case, although I didn't work it. It was a joint case with the Department of Energy when I was there. And I am uh, a little bit more familiar with this particular case. We had a university professor 
who had applied for an NSF grant. And um, he had applied for several grants through NSF and every one of them were declined. So he's getting very frustrated at this point. He's got some research he wants to do, but he can't get any funding to do it. So he applies for another grant and he was awarded for that grant. However, that grant that he said he was doing the work on was already paid through a Chinese institution. So he had already been paid to do that work. And so he got the money and he wasn't doing the research because he'd already done it. And so uh, there were a lot of things that came out of this particular investigation. Um, you know, once you open these cases and you start pulling the string, you just never know where they're going to end up. But for he was convicted for conspiring to commit federal grant fraud, making false statements and obstruction by falsification. And that means he failed to disclose his foreign funding and his U.S. grant applications and his submissions to the university as well. The university was none the wiser. Uh, he did make disclosures at universities uh, regarding travel and conferences, but um, there were some flags there. They disallowed some of his activities, but he went ahead and did them anyway. Um, and so he also was listing, um, it says here, a pattern of person listing conflict of interest that were not allowed. And again, I didn't work this case, but it sounds like he was listing some conflicts of interest uh, that weren't allowed, uh, and that should have been a red flag to the university, and uh, he continued to do them anyway. He also had some subawards to the university that weren't paid. And we've seen that before where they say, hey, I'm gonna hire this consulting firm to help consult us on this research. And just at random, you know, doing some proactive stuff, we pick up the phone and we call XYZ Consulting and say, hey, just wondering how that grant's going with NSF. Uh, we see here, you know, they're working with you on it and they go, I don't know what you're talking about. So that's another fraud that uh, if you're doing some spot testing, maybe something you can consider. But that was a really good case uh, and one of the good examples of several institutions, uh, OIGs, coming together to make that work out. As you can see, he was convicted and sentenced to time served, which he was in, uh, uh, I think, jail for three months before the trial started. So another really good case. And I got one more for you. Okay, lack of adequate documentation for personal expenses and advance expenses. Um, this happens quite a bit. Whenever we have uh, grant money being given to certain people, uh, they don't use the money like they're supposed to. They uh, take trips, like I mentioned earlier, by cars. They have girlfriends. Sometimes those are expensive and you need some extra money. So for this one, it's really important to note that uh, the federal government has grant regulations that require universities to exercise control and oversight over the NSF award funds they receive. Among other things, a recipient of NSF awards must have documentation of salary payments, purchases of equipment, travel, expenses, and other items charged to the awards. The regulations limit cash advances to the recipient's immediate cash needs, and additionally, the regulations require universities to notify any NSF of any significant problems relating to financial management of the award. Well, this is a perfect example, uh, this case of what not to do. Uh, the certifications were false because the university failed to comply with those terms and conditions I was talking about. Again, devil's in the details. NSF is very explicit on what you're supposed to do or not do with its funding. Um, the university dispersed awards without obtaining supporting documents and permitted commingling of the funds, so it was impossible to ensure that the expenditures were reasonable and used solely for the authorized purpose. Uh, 8.4 million was dispersed in advance to team accounts without verification or need. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of money to me. Um, they did not pay federal government interest on it, those advances, and uh, they dispersed them again for salaries without any required documents. Uh, as well as for travel and sundry items. The university knew about this at least two years before they notified NSF. So that ended up being another $2 million settlement and then the university coming up with a compliance plan. So I hope some of these examples uh, can resonate or help you remember some of the things here. Again, be sure to put some questions in the chat uh, and we'll address them as we can. And then we're hopefully have a little bit of time for some questions at the end, but I'm going to turn it over to Laurel now so she can give you a couple of examples of some research integrity investigations. Thanks, Laura. I have just a couple of case studies here uh, that involve uh, our research misconduct administrative investigations. For a finding of research misconduct, 
um, there has to be uh, three elements. First, a significant departure from accepted practices of the relevant research community. Second, the research misconduct has to be committed uh, intentionally or knowingly or recklessly. Um, so in other words, it can't be just some honest error. And uh, third, the allegation needs to be proven by a preponderance of evidence, as uh, Laura mentioned earlier. Uh, here we'll discuss just a couple of examples. Um, this uh, first case here uh, involves both data falsification and plagiarism. And the allegation for this case originated at the university, which informed our office when their inquiry determined an investigation was warranted. Our office deferred our own investigation until the university sent us their report. Uh, the university found that an NSF supported graduate student had falsified data, plagiarized another researcher's dissertation, and committed ethical violations in preparing and submitting a manuscript which two journals published. Uh, specifically, he submitted manuscripts without a co-author's knowledge or consent. He submitted manuscripts, the same manuscript actually, to seven journals simultaneously and falsified a journal submission page using false email addresses for co-authors. The student blamed a hostile work environment, improper supervision, lack of responsible conduct of research training, although the university record showed otherwise, a canceled meeting, and uh, an advisor's lack of interest. The university, in this case, decided to dismiss the student, and the publications were retracted. They also required better student training going forward. Our office agreed with the university finding and recommended a finding of research misconduct, a three-year debarment, and six years of uh, certifications and assurances. NSF agreed with our recommendations, uh, and so those were the outcomes. In this uh, next case study, um, this was one where the uh, allegation actually uh, initially uh, bubbled up on um, our side. And it was a case of plagiarism combined with a merit review violation. So in this case, a faculty member, a principal investigator, an NSF reviewer uh, was found to have copied from an NSF proposal he reviewed into his own. Uh, and then uh, additionally was found to have plagiarized from various sources in other proposals. Uh, the, we referred this case to the university, and eventually the PI acknowledged copying the material, and the university required the uh, PI to submit plagiarism reports for proposals and papers for three years and to complete uh, training. In this case as well, NSF's Office of the Director accepted our recommendations and made a research misconduct finding. Government interests were protected by a two-year debarment of the PI and five years of certifications and assurances. Additionally, the PI was prohibited from serving as an NSF reviewer, advisor, consultant, or rotator. A um, couple of interesting additional facts for this case. Um, NSF viewed this, those supplementary documents uh, just as significantly as the technical content of the grant. And uh, NSF also returned a pending proposal without review due to the research misconduct finding. It's um, perhaps uh, worth mentioning here um, that our office recently completed a report based on an analysis of 10 years of plagiarism case data. Um, so I'll put the link to that report in the chat. And uh, about 80% of our research misconduct cases involve um, some sort of plagiarism. And in this uh, analysis of 10 years of plagiarism data, we found that our plagiarism subjects were often employed in junior academic positions uh, with assistant professor being the most frequent. Um, and uh, with the new uh, PAPG, there's actually gonna 
eventually uh, go into effect, uh, new training requirements uh, for faculty as well as for postdocs and students. Uh, and we're hoping that adding this new uh, training requirement may be helpful in preventing these types of misconduct. A couple of um, final points related to these case studies. Uh, Any time uh, you have questions related to compliance with grant terms, allowable costs, or other matters, please ask your program officer, get their advice in writing, and follow it. We recommend training for everyone that handles any federal awards, including PIs, administrative staff, financial staff, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, while NSF currently only requires responsible conduct of research training for NSF-supported students and postdocs, um, faculty may also benefit uh, and uh, will be required in the future um, to have documented training as well. Uh, I'm going to now uh, shift gears a bit to talk about another important function of our office, uh, which is uh, whistleblower protection. So a core value of the Office of the Inspector General is protecting NSF employees, contractors, award recipients, and subrecipients who step forward to identify potential wrongdoing. Federal law prohibits retaliation for providing information reasonably believed to provide evidence of a violation of law, rule, or regulation, gross mismanagement, gross waste of funds, abuse of authority, or a substantial and specific danger to public health and safety. NSF, contractors and grantees are protected if they make their disclosures to their management, to our office, or to Congress. You can find more information about these protections on our webpage. You can also contact our whistleblower ombudsman listed here. Uh, and he can provide additional information about prohibitions against retaliation for protected disclosures and rights and remedies if such have occurred. Um, please do note, though, that the law does not permit the whistleblower protection coordinator to act as a legal representative, agent, or advocate. But again, this is a useful uh, email address if you have any questions related to uh, specific whistleblower retaliation. And uh, as always, we also hope you'll put any questions in the chat. Uh, for other questions or to report wrongdoing, um, you can always contact our office uh, via the phone numbers listed here uh, or through our website at oig.nsf.gov. Uh, you can even mail concerns to our physical address. Um, right here, I do have like an image of our web page, and you can see that uh, kind of orange or red box uh, in the upper right corner. And if you click on there, it opens a dialogue uh, where you can uh, send us uh, information uh, about any suspected uh, fraud, waste, or abuse, or, or research misconduct. If you are just interested in our office's work, uh, you can actually follow our Twitter account. Uh, but please don't tweet allegations to us uh, since uh, that orange button is a much better way to report fraud, waste, or abuse. Um, the link to this presentation will be available afterwards uh, if you wish to come back for the slides information. Uh, and on the next slide, we also provide our individual email addresses, so uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, we hope that this overview of what the NSF Office of Inspector General does has been useful. Uh, thanks so much for coming today, and we look forward to answering your questions. Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome the presenters back. Um, we have a little bit of time uh, for questions, and um, so I'm going to uh, go through some of the questions that we received. Some we were able to answer in the in the Q and A, and some we felt like would be better if we could just kind of discuss them for the for the larger group. So the first question that I have is: um, if a university determines that a research misconduct investigation is needed, does work on the project stop? Uh, at that point, how is that handled from an OIG perspective? 
Yeah, so I will take that one. And um, in general, if an allegation starts at the university, uh, the university should really follow their policy as far as the way they handle it on campus, um, at least initially. And most universities have a policy uh, where there's an initial inquiry. So when there's first an allegation, uh, there's typically some process uh, to determine whether the allegation has sufficient substance that it should go to investigation. And so uh, during that time, um, uh, it, again, it depends on the university policy, but um, nothing has kind of been proven at that preponderance of evidence standard yet. Uh, and so, um, sometimes universities will go in and sequester data if it's there's some sort of uh, information uh, that needs to be captured, and um, that can be. But if it's something like plagiarism, um, that might be a little bit simpler. So it depends a lot on the facts of the case. Um, universities are required to um, let our office know uh, once uh, they've gone through an inquiry, if it goes to investigation and it involves federal funding. So follow your policy, I guess, is the short answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, asking whether the OIG semi-annual semi reports to Congress disclose the names of people that have been found to have con uh, conducted you know, research misconduct. Yeah. If we do, If we do not, is there a reason why we don't do that? Yeah, and that's also a good question. It's quite different the way that our office handles these cases and the way that um, uh, uh, the Office of Research Integrity at NIH does. And that really has to do with the different regulations that apply and the different types of offices. So because at NSF, we're part of this Office of the Inspector General, that means we're um, technically um, like a type of uh, law enforcement agency. And we are not allowed to make our... Um, findings as public uh, as the ORI does. They have a really different process where they tend to negotiate um, settlements. Um, if uh, any of our uh, subjects are debarred, then they would show up in the debarment database and somebody could search for them. So um, the names do become somewhat public in that case. Okay, we got a question asking us about new disclosure requirements and when those become um, required. And so I'm going to answer that question. So we uh, we issued a revised proposal and award policies and procedures guide last month. It is effective for proposals submitted or due on or after January 30th of 2023. And let me just touch on the different areas uh, where you uh, where NSF collects disclosure information. And specifically, I'm talking about the current and pending support uh, that you provide. So we get that current and pending support at the time of proposal submission. Beginning in uh, January or January 30th, 2023, we are going to be collecting updated um, current and pending support documents for proposals that are being considered for award. Um, so that will be happening. Um, and then we also collect disclosure requirement, uh, disclosure, uh, the current and pending support um, during, uh, as part of annual and final, uh, part of the annual and final reporting process. So if there is new support that was received either since the award was made or since the prior reporting period, then you need to let us know that uh, with a revised current and pending support uh, as part of your annual or final report. And then we also have a process in place if you fail to disclose information um, on your current and pending support and you, you determine that 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 you failed to do that after the award was made, we have a process in place for you to submit um, your current and pending support to us. I should also mention that as part of this new disclosure requirements beginning January 30th, 2023, we will require um, that the PI, co-PI, and other senior project personnel, those are the people, they will be 
required to certify that those uh, dis- that those current pending support documents are current, accurate, and complete. So um, there is information in the PAP guide about that. There will be information in a session on Thursday on a, when we do a PAP guide update as part of this grants conference. We'll be able to, we'll be talking more about that. Um, let me move on. I think we have time for for one more question, um, and this was asking about. Um, uh, do NSF OIG audits have an impact on on single audit uh, on the single audit an institution has? So, if there's a finding from an NSF audit, will that be reflected in the annual external audit? Is the question. Sure. And so, I've never personally conducted a single audit, but the government auditing standards that we all follow um, do require that you um, identify and consider. Uh, results of prior audits and reviews. That's part of the planning process for an audit. So my assumption would be that single auditors uh, would be uh, looking for any prior audits, uh, any audit findings, and they would consider those, um, again, kind of in their um, their risk assessment, um, their decision of what to um, audit as part of the single audit. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not certain of that. Okay, we are we are just about out of time. But before we go, I want to thank all of the panelists for a great session today. And thank you for joining us. And we do have uh, later today, uh, in just about an hour, one more session today covering the major research instrumentation program. And then we also have um, a full day of directorate led sessions tomorrow. So thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.